So, so to summarize the first three talks, epithelium on does not work or works very well. Accelerated doesn't work and works, and LASIK extra is good and bad. So with that. Exactly right. <laughs> I guess our next speaker will be, uh, oh, no, you get to introduce to to uh, John Kanopoulos. <laughs> ah, so John Kanopoulos gets to come up in a timely fashion right after that and tell us about advances in corneal cross-linking combined with surface ablation. <coughs> and you're not allowed to flick Roy in the back of the head. So. All right, promise. Thanks so much for including me. Uh, this is an interesting, at some moments, embarrassing session. <laughs> but it's understandable because we're comparing a fruit market as if they were all apples and they were all oranges. I was trained in the Western world where medicine is evidence-based. So uh, I will try and give you my storyline on several things that we had worked with. These are my financial disclosures. And I, uh, besides the fact that our team has introduced some people have short memory, but a PubMed search will bring the literature up. Uh, several of the cross-linking evolution steps, I do not hold a single patent, nor do I receive royalties for any of these uh, applications that you see on the list. Uh, higher fluence, combining it with LASIK. Actually, combining it with LASIK, we'll speak a little bit about that, was not to accelerate the procedure, it was just try to get UV light through an intact reposition LASIK flap. So let's go and look at uh, some simple things. And uh, many years ago, a lot of our European colleagues spoke of reg uh, disease regression when we had flattening in keratoconus. We now know that this is a intense, random refractive effect of collagen cross-linking. So it is a very intense refractive procedure, especially if uh, the beam and the riboflavin dropping is not, um, uh, is not controlled and uh, well administered. We have shown, and this is the first publication in peer-reviewed literature, that it can achieve eczema-like uh, changes on the cornea if you use a variable fluence, uh, variable pattern type of cross-linking. Uh, and uh, we've shown that it, you can use this in toric uh, situations, like here. This is a progressing cone treated with the photorefractive cross-linking uh, and flattening. This is the amount of flattening. Looks like an eczema-like ablation, hyperopic correct, myopic corrections. The puzzling things, and we, we've had three years' experience in using photorefractive cross-linking, is that it is possible. It's very eczema-like. Epioff worked better than Epion. Sorry, Roy. Uh, but uh, surprisingly, the uh, CXL worked in, even in eyes that were previously cross-linked. And that was a surprise for us, because we didn't expect those eyes to get a refractive change. But what was, what was troublesome is that it didn't have any effect in some virgin corneas. So this, at least for me personally and our research team, shows that we have a lot more to learn about cornea biomechanics and how those tie in with our attempt to manipulate the refractive behavior of a cornea. So going back to how we can use an eczema laser to enhance a cross-linking procedure. Why on earth we, we want to do this? And, and the reason is having an advanced keratoconic eye as you can see here, being able to stabilize it, but dealing with a population that is very poorly compliant in rigid contact lenses. So these patients, after achieving stabilization, and we've worked on this since 2001, remain visually rehabilitation problems. And some of them became transplanted. So that was the, the urge to manipulate the cornea and eczema of the cornea, which was heretic at the time, uh, and try and normalize the cornea. This is not a PRK procedure. This is a partial topography-guided normalization of the cornea. And you can see here the actual intervention. This is a very regular change of the cornea in order to go from here to here. And we all can appreciate that this cornea is still problematic. It still has a lot of uh, low order and higher aberrations, but is a cornea that does not require cornea transplant. And we reported this in the literature, plus we have reported a cumulative of 1,000 treated cases so far in some of the largest case series ever reported in ophthalmology literature. 
Um, the key point here is that these are not, and I want to underline this, these are not refractive surgery for keratoconic patients. These are therapeutic treatments uh, where we're trying to apply these very regular ablations in order to normalize these corneas and rehabilitate these patients functionally. And some results are fantastic. This is a, a pilot that uh, used to be a helicopter pilot, developed post-LASIK ectasia. This is that patient uh, two years later, 2015 vision, was able to go on as uh, in his career in, of aviation. Um, the current technique of what we're using, and we call it the Athens Protocol, is a topography-guided partial, and I want to underline the word partial, uh, PRK, followed by the PTK part, which is meant to remove the epithelium. This is only done because this is a far more sensitive procedure for cyclo rotation compensation. This does not require cyclo rotation compensation. And then mitomycin C for 30, 20 seconds, and uh, not 30 milliwatts, but six milliwatts per centimeter square. So an intermediate accelerated cross-linking, and this is the uh, golden or the sweet spot for our clinical experience. We have shown in, in a large comparative study that doing the sequential or same day uh, has advantages and disadvantages. We have since done it same day because we found less post-PRK uh, haze and a synergistic effect between the two. Um, these are some of the results, and these are remarkable um, if you realize how regular this cornea is here and uh, many years later, in some of these cases, we have 12 years follow-up, um, and these are where it really matters in visual function, and we have reported on how to concentrate or an IHD as your more sensitive and specific metric of how is it that we're regularizing these corneas. Before and after, you can see the pentagon here does not sense any keratoconus. Of course, what you're not seeing here is that we're not changing much the posterior cornea curvature, which adds to aberrations and some uh, still visual uh, problems. Uh, this is a pediatric patient, again, going from stage two to three on the absolute chromite criteria to almost normal. And in my clinical practice as a transplant surgeon, my graphs have not been reduced in number by 20%, as we heard before, but by 90% when I match indications for cornea transplantation for my practice in 2000 and in 2016. And I think this is a very compelling number. Now, this is not a refractive procedure because as you can see here, this normalization induces usually myopia. And uh, it is a procedure practiced now globally as a combination of topography guided, uh, partial PRK and cross-linking. We have, uh, as I mentioned before, reported uh, a very large body of long-term evidence of the stability of this technique. Now, the latest thing that we're trying to work with is use what I mentioned before, the refractive cross-linking component in conjunction with the Athens protocol in order to reduce the amount of tissue uh, needed to be removed. And as you can see here, let me go back. Uh, this is a very variable pattern. See this, this little uh, uh, area here received 15 joules of energy. This is three times the Dresden protocol. The one outside of that received 10 joules of energy and the seven millimeter diameter, five joules of energy. So this is a variable fluence, very variable pattern. I will disagree with the previous speaker. We focus this on the thinnest part of the cornea, not the uh, uh, most concave on posterior cornea surface, surfacture because uh, Pentacam is severely biased in these irregular cases or any type of sign fluke imaging. So this is, it looks very similar to what we saw before with the PRK cross-linking cases. The secret here is that we did, do, we, the refractive numbers on the PRK were zero. So zero sphere, zero astigmatism, and this refractive effect is just from the normalization process of the topography guided PRK plus the refractive CXL. Again, before and after and the difference. And uh, as far as its use in laser, uh, the higher fluence there is meant to penetrate through the intact cornea and reach the riboflavin that has been placed on the stromal bed. So it is performed after repositioning the flap and soaking. And we reported this first at the ESCRS in 2007 and at the subsequent academy. 
And we've shown, at least in our uh, clinical practice, in a contralateral eye study published at the JRS in 2012, that the data on the eyes that had adjunct cross-linking hyperopia far surpassed the non-CXL treated eyes, thus uh, making us discontinue further study of this and employing cross-linking, high fluence cross-linking in all hyperopic LASIK cases since. We've had employed it in very high myopic patients and young myopic patients, not from first keratoconic patients, we reported this as well, and also as a tool to stabilize enzymatic digestion in some more complicated cases. So these are our current protocols on our Athens protocol for keratoconus, six milliwatts for using it in conjunction with LASIK, 30 milliwatts, and um, uh, we'll hear more speakers speak of other applications. Um, this is an ex vivo study looking at different fluences. And uh, in conclusion, uh, I think we all agree that cross-linking stabilizes ectasia. And I'm going to stay with my last part of the conclusions here. I think we all need to come together and compare these techniques in an objective matter and stop presenting case series to one each other. Thank you very much for your attention.